Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, my name is Dr. Anthony Chow, and welcome to the School Library uh, Summit Symposium, um, uh, part one of, uh, we hope, uh, to be a three-part series. I um, also want to thank uh, our co-sponsors, uh, the iSchools from the University of South Carolina and Simmons Universities. My interest in school library advocacy began a decade ago with a phone call from a former student at UNC Greensboro. She was in tears. She had just taken over as a school library media specialist for the most diverse elementary school in the county. And what she found was a library with no budget and an outdated uh, average age of the collection, 25 years old, that did not reflect her diverse student population. The only access to funds that she had was through the parents um, and uh, those were at a Title I school. It was on that day that I committed myself to trying to help as a parent of three children, as an LS professor, as an instructional designer, as an educational psychologist. I know how important it is to allow children a wide array of resources so they can choose what they want to read, what they want to be. That situation in North Carolina and today in California, the wealthiest state in the nation, I'm told that many elementary schools have school libraries run by untrained parent volunteers. As a field, we must do something. All children, especially those in poverty, deserve equal access to high quality reading material and resources that resonate with who they are and what they wanna know more about. We cannot and should not ask parents to pay for that. What if they can't? This is why we have gathered this incredible group of library leaders here today. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to my co-host and fellow co-chair of the Elise Council of Deans, Directors, and Chairs, Dr. Sanda Erdeles. Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Sanda Erdeles. I'm the Interim Dean uh, of the College of Organizational, Computational, and Information Science at Simmons University, which also houses the School of Library and Information Science. And as Anthony said, uh, I'm currently a co-chair of the Elise Council of Deans, Directors and Chairs, and also uh, many roles, uh, many hats, uh, serve as the chair of the iSchool organization. Uh, a bit of personal background, I was uh, born in Croatia and uh, my elementary school library was for teachers only. So occasionally as a good student, uh, I was sent to receive some books from this hidden place, uh, the uh, library where you know teachers are finding their resources. And uh, I would also linger in there and explore to, to see what was available. But there was no library accessible to students. Um, public and university libraries I was growing up were also closed texts. And it was only until I came to the United States in late 80s that I actually got emerged into notion of full library experience. And then when my two children were born in the US, um, I actually fell in love with school libraries because that's, that was the first time that I experienced their open school libraries. Uh, in my current role, I'm very much uh, um, following and uh, promoting activities in high schools and LIS programs. Uh, and uh, in this role, um, I see that uh, we are strategically dedicated to providing the highest level of, of uh, graduate education uh, to information professionals in variety of information agencies and the school librarians, or also we call them school library teachers, are a unique group of students in our programs that have a very important role in impacting student learning during their most formative years. Two issues that I'm personally hoping uh, that we, I will gain from uh, this uh, meeting today, this webinar. One issue is, how to ensure the high quality and consistency in master degree program uh, that is uh, centered on uh, students who are interested in becoming school librarians, especially uh, given the current trends uh, and how these current trends should be addressed in the curriculum. And I'm also very much interested in uh, finding out how to ensure 
career transportability and flexibility for school librarians because we do have that uh, transferability and flexibility uh, for many other career paths in library information science. It is really great to see so many of you in today's webinar and I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you, Sanda. Okay, now it's time for our two keynote speakers, Keith Curry-Lance and Kathy Lester. So a little bit about both. Uh, Keith Curry-Lance is a consultant who works with libraries and related organizations as a researcher, statistician, public speaker, proposal writer, and facilitator. He is best known in the school library community as the principal investigator of the most prolific research team, studying the impact of school libraries and librarians on academic achievement and student learning. That team is now involved in another landmark study to investigate what's really going on behind the data indicating dramatic losses of school librarians since the Great Recession. Next is Kathy Lester. Kathy Lester is the school librarian at East Middle School in Plymouth, Michigan, and the 22-23 president of the American Association of School Librarians. She is also a past member of ALA's Committee for Library Advocacy, where we first met, uh, and also the ALA Library Ec Ecosystem Subcommittee. You can ask questions via Q&A as well as via the chat. Uh, we will all try to answer them. Keith has asked to try to keep questions directly to him until the end of his uh, presentation. And as I've said, all panelists feel free to respond as, as you are able to uh, and prefer. So Keith will go first. Keith. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the findings so far of the SLIDE project. That stands for the School Librarian Investigation Decline or Evolution. We've got several major reports out already. Uh, from our first year, we uh, did a survey of our uh, state intermediaries on the project from all 50 states in DC and collected data from them about uh, conditions, policies, and practices in their states that sort of set the context for school librarian employment. So that's what those first two links are about. Uh, in the summer of 21, we published what we refer to as our perspectives report for short, because we looked at a, a decade of National Center for Education Statistics data about school librarian employment from national, state, and district level perspectives. Uh, during the life of this project, we're doing articles for the annual uh, Library and Book Trade Almanac. Uh, this last month, we published a special report that we hadn't planned on doing uh, about the impact of the COVID pandemic on uh, inequities and in access to school librarians. Uh, future publications will include an article in the special issue of the Peabody Journal of Education uh, about school libraries. Uh, we'll be focusing specifically on inequities uh, associated with race and ethnicity. And our final report will be called Voices of Decision Makers. And I'll speak more about that in a bit. Here's some of our major findings from this project so far. Uh, in the 2021 data, the latest available right now, 46 states in DC provided credible data 30% of the districts in those states reported no librarians. They didn't leave it blank, they reported zero. That doesn't include uh, schools in districts where there are any librarians at all, but no librarians at particular schools. Um, so not the whole picture. When we looked at this same group uh, in the 2018-19 data, which was for all 50 states, uh, we found that seven and a half million students are affected by those uh, losses or the, that lack of availability, uh, lack of access to librarians. When you ask people why school librarian positions have been cut, the almost universal first answer is, we love librarians and we just didn't have enough money. Uh, the data does not support that explanation. Uh, in the decade of data we looked at in the perspectives report, we see librarian uh, uh, FTEs going down year after year after year, while other positions went up and up and up. Um, there was money to pay for one, but not the other. Uh, we expected that uh, librarian employment would be associated with district 
spending per pupil. Surprisingly, it wasn't. Uh, surprisingly, the districts that had the best library staffing were those that spent the most and the least per pupil, leaving the ones in between uh, doing more poorly. The thing Deb and I are most concerned about from our findings so far is the issue of equity. Uh, what we have found is that several demographic variables have a huge impact on access to school librarians. The smaller a district is, the less likely it is to have librarians. The more isolated or rural it is, likewise. Uh, staffing is not likely to be as, as good. It's more likely to be altogether absent. If it's a district that has a lot of students in poverty, a lot of minority students, or a lot of English language learners. Uh, we also went uh, back and looked at the NCES data through the lens of the data we collected in our, our context report, our context survey. Uh, the two things that correlated with librarian employment were these. Uh, school librarian mandates are important. And interestingly, whether they're enforced or not, uh, states that have mandates for school librarians that are enforced have the best staffing ratios related to schools. Uh, those that had mandates that weren't enforced had the next best staffing and the states that had no mandates at all were at the bottom. Uh, similarly, the number of institutions uh, that prepare school librarians was correlated with staffing levels. The, the more institutions uh, offering training for school librarians, uh, the higher the level of staffing relative to schools in that state. Our advisory council asked us to look as closely as we could at what's going on in the districts that reported no librarians. The one thing we could tell them is that half of those districts, half of those districts that report no librarians do report library support staff. So the libraries in those, those districts and their schools uh, must be being run by support staff who don't have on-site supervision. Uh, they may, may only have supervision from the district or even the regional level. We also looked at what was going on over time for the, the four years of data we could clean up the best uh, of that latest decade at the time, 15, 16 through 18, 19. If a district reported that it didn't have any librarians by 15, 16, by 18, 19, only one out of 10 of those positions had been reinstated. So once the positions are gone, it's an uphill battle getting them back. We also are dealing with a lot of data issues. We dealt with a lot of them in the process of doing our research for this report. The uh, NCES data comes from something called the Common Core of Data. They collect data about all kinds of school staffing in, in full-time equivalents. Unfortunately, for all the positions they collect data for, the definitions are very outdated. Uh, and none of the definitions, including the, the one for librarians, makes any reference to state certification. So that's the limit of the way the data is defined. At the state level, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, cleaning up as best we could three different sets of issues. One was historical inconsistencies from year to year about how a state reported. This often meant going back to state sources and revising the data that the NCES had to make it more accurate. We also found in states where there were inconsistencies between the data they reported to NCES and the data the state itself reported, did what we could with those cases. And then we also had a few states where there were high levels of missing data, lots of districts just not reporting at all. We were able to get data for a lot of those districts, not all of them, but quite a few. Um, we have a dilemma in the school library world here in the United States, at least, a real dearth of data. 2012 was the last year that the National Center for Education Statistics conducted its quadrennial sample survey of school libraries nationwide. That's a decade ago. We have had no new data collected for a decade. Fortunately, we have the common core of data 
staffing figures, but that's really it. We have no other data at the national level about school libraries. So that's something we hope this project will, will uh, stir up a bit of concern about and see some action about. Uh, we're in the final phase of this project, uh, shifting from uh, quantitative to qualitative focus. We've conducted more than 50 interviews with school leaders uh, who've made decisions about school library staffing. And amazingly enough, we got people in all three of these groups to talk to us. Districts where they added librarians, districts where they cut some, but not all of the librarians, and districts where librarians were altogether eliminated. Frankly, I thought that last group would be tough to get. We got some of them to talk to us. Uh, we're learning a lot about their explanations, their own rationalizations for why they made those decisions. Some of them are very structural. Something else drove it, wasn't up to me. Sometimes it's very pragmatic. They felt like they had to deal with some kind of coverage issue, a word we heard a lot. And sometimes it was a strategic matter. They made a decision because they wanted to achieve something and they felt that either a librarian would help to achieve that, so they added them, or they felt like some other position was more important. Uh, we're also interested as we analyze these interviews to see what we can learn about the E in slide, the evolution part. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, curiosity about the, the data and the limits of it, uh, how well does it reflect jobs that have been combined, jobs that have been restructured, and most especially jobs that have been given different titles. So far we have a list, I think it's around a couple of dozen job titles that school librarians have that don't have the L word in them. The word library or librarian doesn't appear in their job title. How accurately are those counted? Hopefully from the interviews, we'll get some sense about that. Uh, the Libslide website uh, has everything there is to know about our project on it. Uh, our presentations and publications, our PowerPoint slides, uh, videos of some of the presentations. All of our own reports are there on the, present, uh, the publications page, including infographics and videos. We also have a news page. The study has been referenced in a lot of other publications and data from it cited in those publications. We have links to those there. But perhaps the most valuable part of our website is the interactive data tools. Uh, the data on the NCES website is technically available, but it's buried pretty deep and it's pretty tough to get at it. We have designed what we believe are some much more user-friendly uh, interactive data tools that will allow you to pull out of that all the data we can make available to you, exactly what data you want, for who you want it for, for whatever years you want it for. And um, you see the four different types of tools we have listed there. We hope you'll give them a try. If you have any issues with them, any questions about them, uh, please use the link uh, provided to get back to us and let us know what your concern is. Uh, uh, Deb was very sorry she couldn't be with us today, but we're, she and I are both very keenly interested in this uh, series of summit meetings and we'll be watching them very carefully. Uh, if any of you have uh, questions or comments uh, uh, about the slide project, uh, we would be more than happy to uh, try to address them. And uh, wish you well for the rest of the day. It's gonna be a great meeting. Thank you so much, Keith. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, now, uh, we're honored to have the president of the American Association of School Libraries, Kathy Lester, uh, who will provide some remarks. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, everyone. I wanted to go ahead and um, present some remarks um, about advocacy um, for school libraries. Um, I am... Um, I will say that I'm an experienced advocate. Um, I've been involved in a wide range of advocacy efforts, um, probably since 2013. I've been president of the Michigan School Library Association, have been their advocacy chair or co-chair um, for many years. I've been on the ALA Committee of Library Advocacy, as well as the Ecosystem Subcommittee um, as well as my day job of being a school librarian in Plymouth, Michigan. Um, I'm 
Although I would say also that I'm a passionate advocate. In fact, I have been accused of that in the past. I really feel it's important that all of our students have equity of access to school libraries staffed with certified school librarians. Um, in um, the ALA Committee of Library Advocacy, um, we created a infographic called Students Reach Greater Heights with School Librarians. Um, and um, what I have found in my years of advocacy is that it's really important that our advocacy stay student-centered um, we really have to talk about what school libraries, school librarians can do for students. And so I just wanted to review real quickly um, what we came up with was five main points um, for this infographic, along with data to support those points. Um, so I thought I would start by reviewing that. Um, the first point is that students achieve more in schools with libraries and librarians. Um, we are teachers and, and we're the school's largest classroom. And so um, research shows that this benefits um, student achievement. And what it also shows is that it's actually more important for disadvantaged students, that they show actually a greater benefit when there's a professional school librarian there to help them. And unfortunately, um, what Keith's data is showing is that those are the students that are least likely to have access to a school library with a certified school librarian. So it makes me even more passionate about this. Um, the other thing as we are all seeing with the environment with book challenges today is that certified school librarians have that training to be able to curate diverse collections and provide our students the resources that they need um, across grade levels in multiple formats so that they can um, support, we support the curriculum as well as providing students those self-directed learning resources. The other thing is um, we support technology and a lot of schools were known as being the technology leader in our school. And so um, in this respect, we really support students, but we're also supporting teachers as well um, by helping teachers access those technology resources and oftentimes co-teaching lessons um, that include integrated technology. Um, this, Fourth point is that students really do value the school library as a safe space. Um, we wanna make sure that students have that space to um, do some self-directed learning, to feel like there are resources there that support them. And then the fifth and um, final point on this infographic is that um, school librarians teach um, information, media literacy, digital citizenship skills, these skills that our students need um, to not just be prepared, better prepared for college, but these are really career and life skills that we need. And again, in today's environment, um, these skills of evaluating information and being able to um, spot misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation is even more important than in previous years, I feel. And again, there's that equity issue that um, the students are disadvantaged really benefit proportionally more um, by having a full-time certified school librarian at their school. Um, so I wanted to show um, an example of two middle schools. Um, I advocate at my state legislature. I'm in Michigan and I go talk to some legislators and they're like, what are you talking about? Every school has a school library. And in Michigan and in many schools, they do not. Um, so this um, school on the left with the empty shelves, this superintendent decided to close the school library in 2021. Um, and you would say, oh, well, maybe that school librarian was not doing a good job. No, it was an award-winning school librarian who 
um, the superintendent would not budge no matter how much advocacy we did. On the right hand side, this is actually my middle school library. And um, you can just, and that's just a small portion of my library. But even more important, if you look at this next slide, is not just the books, it's more than the books. As a school librarian, I provide my students um, not just access to the resources, but support in finding those resources. I teach those information literacy skills. I teach digital citizenship skills. I support the technology. I support my teachers. So if you think about all of the resources and the support that the students and the staff are getting over here on the right-hand side compared to the left-hand side, um, it's just something that is really um, disappointing to me and something that inspires me to do more to try to advocate um, so that this doesn't happen. Because as Keith said, once um, a school does that with their school library, it is very difficult to advocate to bring it back and expensive. So um, what does the American Association of School Librarians show say? So our position statement is that every school should have a certified school librarian. Um, and that also aligns with the vision statement of AASL that every learner has a school librarian. And it's something that we're very committed to. But how are we in achieving that vision? Like, where do we stand? And again, um, this is from the slide study um, with Keith Curry Lance and Deb Cockle. And I happen to be an on that advisory group on that study. Um, I happen to be a little bit of a data geek. Um, and so um, if you look at this map, the darker states are the states that are a little bit closer to reaching that one FTE per school. None of them have actually reached it or gone above it, but some are closer than others. And if you look at the lighter color states, those states um, tend to be further away from meeting that goal. Um, and as Keith mentioned, some of the things are that the darker states may have state laws um, requiring schools or some kind of guidance um, for requiring school librarians in those states. States like Virginia, Vermont, Tennessee, um, all have um, some kind of requirement. Um, and then I get asked this a lot. So why don't we have a law at the federal level requiring all schools to have school librarians. And um, it is difficult because there's um, kind of a um, difference in the federal role and the state role in education. Um, the 10th amendment is the one that basically says if it's not listed in the constitution, then either the states or the people have the rights to control or govern that. And I don't think education is specifically called out. So that role is given to the states. And so then what happens is as this um, quote here shows, you basically have some standards and quality varying from state to state, town to town, and even district to district. Um, federal advocacy and federal doc laws can make an impact when issues concern equal access, safeguarding students' rights, safeguarding teachers' rights. Um, there is the Every Student Succeed Act, which was a reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And that is basically guidance for um, grants, the Title I, Title II, Title IV grants that the federal government distributes to states. And those grants are distributed based on poverty level. So it is an issue where they are trying to provide better access by giving um, those poor districts or poor states more money. Um, and when we talk later in the panel, um, I have some ideas of things that can be done with that to strengthen that. 
And, but in state and local advocacy work, I wanted to point out that um, it's really important that we align our work with the goals of educational leaders and stakeholders, and also the importance of um, building partnerships. And I am so grateful that seeing that LIS educators interested in this topic and thinking about what role can they have and how they can help um, advocate as well. So I appreciate that. I'm very thankful to be here. I just wanted to give a brief overview of you know, what this looked like in Michigan since I have been involved in this in Michigan for a really long time. Um, I kind of, we have in Michigan taken essentially like a three-prong approach. We've advocated with legislators and our governor. We've advocated at the Michigan Department of Education. And then we've also built a lot of partnerships um, with different groups around our state. So briefly, um, at the legislative level, we have gotten three bills introduced to require school libraries, require them to be staffed by school librarians. And then the third bill is that if the school librarian is absent, that someone covers basically and keeps the library open. Um, the issue is these bills are still sitting in the House Education Committee. Um, the controlling party um, doesn't want to even give us a hearing on these bills. Um, we've met with the governor, trying to get the governor to support as well. And there's an educator advisory council and they have recommended that the governor support the bills as well. Um, and she does in um, theory, I guess I would say, but um, she hasn't really been able to, again, she's not a part of the controlling party. Um, with the Michigan Department of Ed, um, there's been a lot of work done with them in trying to strengthen um, some of the policies around school libraries and try to um, strengthen our certification requirements for library media staff. And so we've worked really hard with them beginning when um, the Every Student Succeed Act was first introduced in 2015, 2016, basically, we advocated, um, there was language in Every Student Succeed Act around school libraries that these title funds could be spent on school libraries, but the state plans had to be written to include that. So we did work with them. We did get some um, inclusion by the state of Michigan. Um, also, there's been a statewide literacy effort. Um, Michigan, back a few years ago, we were like in the basement um, in terms of our literacy scores. And in fact, if you line up our literacy scores and our graph of school librarians, they basically mimic each other in our state. Um, but yet when they first started these literacy plans, school librarians weren't included. And so we had to advocate very hard to get school librarians included. And we did in the school-wide practices, we were eventually included. Um, and then with the partnerships, these are um, that upper part there is all of the um, groups that um, signed on to a letter um, to ask the legislature to give us a hearing on the school library bills. Um, so we work with a diverse group of um, associations um, to help us in our advocacy efforts. And then with the Michigan Association of School Boards, the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators, and the secondary school principals, we, um, they all wrote articles that they sent out to all of their members um, with the increase in funding um, from the COVID funds, as well as our state um, increase the per pupil funding for students. So they all put out articles that basically said, now is the time to invest in school libraries. So they were trying to support our efforts by reaching out to their members and letting them know that they should be investing in school libraries. But what does that in reality look like? <laughs> 
this is the graph. Um, and then as I mentioned, if you lined up the literacy scores um, from national comparison, it would actually mimic this as we lost school librarians. We also lost, um, stepped back in our literacy scores. Um, we have tipped up the effort. Um, and um, you see a little dip there due to the pandemic, but the last data that I have, we've actually come up back higher than pandemic numbers. Not a lot, but a little bit. And what, I don't have the numbers for this school year yet because it's so early in the school year, but having seen all of the um, postings for school librarians in our state, um, I believe that the number and the graph will be continuing to go up this year as well. But we are far from where we need to be. And one of the issues now, um, honestly, is that school districts want to hire school librarians and they're having a hard time finding them. We have a shortage of school librarians available um, for the open positions. So, um, in summary, um, advocacy is really not a short-term project. I feel like somehow um, we need to find a way um, to be able to put a continued sustained effort into it. Um, and often I have these five P's of advocacy and they are being present, being prepared, being polite, being positive, and then that final one of being persistent. Um, so I try to um, be positive and um, take any small step forward as a great step to stay motivated and keep working um, towards advocacy. All right, so I think I have a few minutes. I don't know if there were any questions. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the panel later and I'll talk about specifically some ideas for moving forward. All right. Thank you, Kathy, very much. Um, I did wanna surface one question that I believe Jackie asked about kind of the move towards instructional technology uh, and, and the uh, conflict it creates in terms of being stretched maybe too thin in that area, as opposed to being able to do the more traditional school librarian uh, duties. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, maybe how to uh, surf that or navigate that? Um, well, I it is difficult. I do feel like um, we do have to keep our toe in the side of technology um, to maintain our positions. But to focus on literacy um, is, I think, a really important thing. And there are a lot of states that are having these literacy efforts right now. And so I feel it's like it's really important for us to make sure we're involved in those. Like I do see that the tipping point in Michigan had to do with talking about how school librarians supported literacy. The tipping point did not have to do with how we were helping technology because you know, um, they can go out and buy technology, uh, you know, buy higher technology people. Um, but those technology people don't have the literacy expertise that we have. Um, and the, the training on, you know, curation and teaching information literacy and all of those other skills. So I think part of it is having to remind people all the time that those are actually the most important parts of our work, the literacy and teaching information literacy skills, rather than the technology is really more of a support. Great point, Kathy, great distinction. Sanda? Yes, and if I could add, uh, in some ideal world, obviously as uh, library information professionals, we would like to be recognized for who we are, for our training, for what we bring. But sometimes opportunities uh, appear from unexpected angles. And I would say in response to Jackie, the key question is how we turn this opportunity uh, that came with COVID where we were the ones, uh, our field was the ones who could really quickly step in and be very helpful 
how we uh, help transform this awareness from the role that we were quickly able to fill to the awareness about other roles that we know we have, but others around us may not be as aware and may not see uh, that these roles uh, may be so important, even though we know they are. So some of these uh, techniques, skills of uh, redirecting uh, attention and bringing recognition, I think it would be really helpful for broader audience to see how it worked for those who were able to make these switches and bring the attention. Thank you, Sanda. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you to uh, both uh, Keith and uh, Kathy for your insight and leadership. Uh, Kathy, I really, again, like your uh, model of uh, really uh, talking, uh, gathering a coalition in your state. I know we've talked about that before. It's definitely a good um, uh, roadmap for others to try to do the same thing. So, so thank you for that. And certainly uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we're sharing that broadly. Um, the next hour will involve two panels. Uh, the topic of the first panel is what does a school uh, library, or actually, I take that back. It's changed now to how can we empower school librarians to create excellent school library programs. Um, I also wanted to reiterate that er this recording, the slides, links, everything will be uh, posted soon after uh, uh, this uh, symposium. So you will have ac direct access to everything shared here today. So delighted to have uh, this uh, distinguished panel of uh, Karen G Gavigan, Jonathan Hunt, and Cynthia, Cynthia Richardson Johnson. Uh, to save time, I'm going to allow each one of uh, them to introduce themselves. Uh, and then uh, um, I believe that this group already has organized themselves around uh, the conversation that they are going to have. So uh, really look forward to uh, your discussion. Uh, Karen, Karen, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to have you here. Speaking of empowering, um, Anthony told us before we got on that over 560 people um, registered. So those who will be seeing the recording um, just delighted so many people are here and from all over the world. It's been interesting seeing the chat. So thank you for coming. So I've got uh, two great people on the panel with me. I'm going to start by introducing myself and then um, I'll turn it over to them. So my name is Karen Gavigan and I'm a professor and interim director of the School of Library and Information Science at the University of South Carolina. Um, I'm a former school librarian for 15 years. Um, and in our program, we have the benefit of having all school librarians required by our legislature. So, um, and as you learn from Keith, that's not always so, so we feel very lucky. Um, we have a certification program. We currently this fall have 178 school library students in our program, which um, we, uh, but we have a lot of shortages around the state. And I just wanna tell you about a couple of things we have going on that I really do think helps us produce excellent librarians, which means excellent results and excellent library programs. So one is a cohort program. And I saw we have Christy James from Charleston Public um, School District. And um, we have been in a cohort program with Christy and her wonderful crew. Uh, we're on the fourth cohort with them. We've also um, done cohorts with Florence and Darlington School Districts. And what that means is um, they get a lot of um, benefits for their students to come through their um, classroom teachers who want to be school librarians. Um, and then they come through together. Um, and, and as a group, um, typically we have a minimum of eight, sometimes as many as 12. Um, and then they get um, special benefits. Um, we do professional de development with them. We, they get the AASL standards and they go to um, conferences. Um, through this cohort model. So, you know, would encourage programs to do more of that. It's a great opportunity to bring in from districts who, who are high needs in terms of meeting, um, having, having losses from retirement and, and things. The other thing we do, and I know Virginia, I can speak, does this well as well, are regional workshops. So we have a collaboration between our iSchool um, between the South Carolina Association of School Librarians, which is an excellent um, school library association in the state, and our, also our liaison at the Department of Ed. Um, we do four around the state once a year, um, and it's a great opportunity for professional development. 
Uh, we have strong advocacy workshops. We have this, this year, the focus is going to be on um, the book banning attempts in our state and intellectual freedom issues. So those are just a couple of ideas in terms of um, helping um, library programs and certifications help with creating excellent librarians. So now I'll turn it over uh, to my partner on the panel and a wonderful PhD student in our program, Cynthia Rickerton Johnson. Hello, everyone. Like Dr. Gavigan stated, my name is Cynthia Johnson. I am a former school librarian from South Carolina. I have 10 years of experience as a school librarian. Before that, I was a reading specialist, um, also in Atlanta, Georgia, and South Carolina. So um, literacy is something I'm very passionate about. I am currently a doctoral student um, with a focus on school librarianship and equity, diversity, and inclusion. I also teach one of our capstone courses that's specific to school library programming. That's at the end, towards the end of a student's um, journey through their master's program. I have presented at a couple of different um, conferences, many of them with dealing with literacy, um, recruitment and retention of um, black school librarians was my last presentation that I did. Um, as well as maker spaces. So I kind of have my hand in a couple of different um, areas of interest when it comes to school librarianship. Um, I did want to point out one um, program that I participated in. It was actually um, spearheaded by uh, school librarian Erica Long, and it was through the ASO Improving Represent Representation Mentoring Program. And I was partnered with a school librarian actually here in South Carolina. And I decided to be a part of this particular program because um, I wanted, because, you know, when you're a school librarian, especially at a middle school, you're the only one, you feel very isolated. And so I wanted to get more um, mentoring, more tips, more advice on what it's like to be a librarian of color. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be paired with someone in South Carolina. So that particular mentoring program, I thoroughly enjoyed um, as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan Hunt. Um, I'm obviously Jonathan Hunt. I am in my 10th year as the coordinator of library media services at the San Diego County Office of Education. I started my career as a classroom teacher where I taught grades four through eight. Then I went to San Jose State University and got a master's degree. Um, I worked in um, libraries that serve students K through 12, but the vast majority of my experience has been focused at the elementary level. In order to better answer the question that we've been given, I wanted to give you some context for my situation here in San Diego County and the districts that I work with, so that when I answer the question, you would better understand um, where I'm coming from. We do have 42 local school districts that we support. Of those 42, only six of them have teacher librarians. Only two of those six have teacher librarians at every site in the district. And one of the six, which happens to be the second largest district in the state, has less than three teacher librarians for the whole district. They have about 120 schools. So you can imagine the, the level of support that they are offering through their school library program. Of the remaining 36 districts in the county, 18 of them contract with me for something called librarian of record. California Education Code provides that if you do not hire a teacher librarian, you can contract with either your county office of education or a public library to be the librarian of record. So 18 of them have signed up with me. So that's about 100,000 students almost that I support. They all have library media technicians in their libraries, but they don't have any teacher librarian. So I am at best a, a consulting librarian. They, you know, I, I, I perform a consulting role for them. That means if you're doing the math, there are 18 school districts that what we would technically, we would say they're out of compliance. So we're one of the, we're in that group that Keith described as having a mandate, but it's unenforced. Um, so we have 18 of our 42 districts 
have library media technicians, but they don't have any teacher librarian and they don't have they don't have any contract with a public library or with a county office of education. I also want to say that this crisis is especially pronounced at the elementary level. We have less than three elementary teacher librarians in the entire county. Um, so the vast majority of our teacher librarians are focused at the high school level with a little bit um, with a little bit also at the at the middle school level. So it's kind of a bleak picture. I want to talk a little bit about how we got there. It's probably a very complicated story. I mean, uh, from my view, there are two really important things. Um, we had a very important tax law that was passed 44 years ago, Prop 13, that kind of initiated this boom or bust budget cycle that we've been kind of trapped in every year, where one year California is rich and the next year it's poor. Uh, I noticed in the chat that Dr. Farmer mentioned an earlier law in 1974 that kind of stripped away some of the additional funding. So there are definitely other factors in play. But for me, this is probably one of the more important ones. And then over the last several decades, we've definitely had a growing population with diverse needs, and that's also strained finances. Um, just to give you a couple of examples of that, we have a lot of multi-language learners. I mean, Spanish, of course, but we have districts that have at least a dozen and sometimes two dozen different home languages spoken within the district. So that that's the level of complexity that requires a lot of support and a lot of finances to deal with. Another another thing is we've got districts that are very, very urban and they deal with a set of challenges. And then we have districts that are very, very rural and they have their own unique set of challenges. So it's a very, di very large state and a very diverse state. And so I think that these are some of the most important factors that have kind of brought us to the place where we are. What that means for school libraries is that we have undergone decades of chronic underfunding, but we are not alone. Everybody's gone through chronic underfunding. So logic is not going to matter. Facts are not going to matter. Research is not going to matter because everybody else in line for a handout also has those. Visual and performing arts also has all their ducks in a row for that. Maintenance and operations and facilities also, you know, so it's just this very draconian situation in terms of the budget and the school financing. And we have made strides in recent years because the economy has been booming, um, but we seem to be perhaps heading into a recession and then, you know, then the fun will begin once again. So what this means for the system as a whole is that we have people in San Diego County that are teachers that do not have the experience of collaborating with a teacher librarian. They don't have the opportunity to plan, teach, and assess a unit of instruction. And so some of those people will become administrators. They'll become principals or they'll become district administrators, and they won't have that knowledge of what a school library program really is beyond a book warehouse. And some of those will become, you know, will work at the county office, they'll work in state educational organizations. So the, or, the deep organizational knowledge uh, that's not superficial about what school libraries really do and the impact that they can bring is rapidly eroding. You know, Keith talked earlier about the number of teacher librarian positions that decrease. And as, that, as they decrease, you know, there are a whole group of students and teachers and administrators that don't have the opportunity to collaborate with them. So what that means at the, at the bottom line is this is a systemic issue that's not easily solved at the site level. It's not going to be lobbying the PTA or the school site council or the principal or going before the school board even. And it's not going to be a magic law that you sign in, you know, you know, that you sign in that says everybody has a teacher librarian because we don't have the capacity, you know, in our teacher librarian program uh, pipeline to deal with that. And even more importantly, the administrators don't have the capacity about what to do with a school librarian. So uh, I, I apologize for my very long-winded introduction, but I did want to provide you some context for um, for revisiting our question that we have before us, which is how can we empower school librarians to build excellent school library programs?
we talked about this idea, and these are these are some ideas that we put forward, some of many that that we were kind of in agreement around. So I'm going to share this slide, but then in the following, we have some follow-up questions that we will engage in further conversation. So um, I'm going to rip off a phrase from Michael Fullan, uh, who's an educational guru, and his phrase is, go slow to go fast. And he's talking about implementation of change ideas. So mine is actually related to visioning. And I'm gonna say go small to go big. So what I mean by that is we do so much that it's very difficult to describe what we do in a very compelling, concise manner. But we need those elevator speeches to provide clarity, not just for our stakeholders, but for ourselves, they can almost become affirmation. So less is more common language that everybody uh, everybody understands really helps put the message out there and making sure that our roles are connected to student outcomes is critically important. So my elevator speech, I'm gonna give you the three second version of it, but if you're interested in the 30 second version, you can click on this link and it's kind of like an accordion. I can do a three hour version and a professional learning or I can take three days, but I can do whatever I need to do. But um, this is my promise to you, okay? This is my elevator speech. If you give me an excellent school library program, K-12, and you give me students, in return, I'm going to give you students that are extremely well-versed in literacy, learning, and leadership, okay? Those are words that are unambiguous. Everybody in the educational system buys into them. You would look like an idiot if you didn't agree with me, right? So I just, you know, I just return to those over and over again. I really appreciate, you know, like I love the six shared foundations and the four domains, but that's a lot of stuff to wrap your head around in terms of messaging for a stakeholder group. This is more, uh, you know, I just, it, it's hard to do that in an elevator speech. It's better for an internal conversation that we have with each other. Um, so the school library program, once you refine it to its core essence, then you can see how grand and how big this can be in the broad scheme of things. We can weave together very disparate elements into a co cohesive whole. And um, I've listed some of those, okay, on the slide, community schools, is an issue that the California state budget allocated $4 billion for over the past two years. So we're putting librarians out there in the field that don't understand that these are what the legislature spent money on the past couple of years. Because, you know, there's a thing that says budgets are statements of value. There was no school library. I mean, we just heard about Michigan. There was nothing in the California budget for school libraries either. But these are the things that the legislature valued. And so what I think is incumbent upon us as librarians is to see the connection between what the state is spending on money, because those are the things that they value. And those can easily be woven into a comprehensive school library program. So um, now I'm going to pass it back over to Karen, who's going to moderate our conversation. We we picked several questions out for you. We probably won't get all of, to all of them, but I'm going to turn it back over to Karen. Okay. So you can see on the screen there are four, but I, I uh, sort of cherry picked, and I'm going to have um, Jonathan and Cynthia ask um, the one number two. What single element of a school library program, if properly implemented and scaled, would change the perception of school libraries and the broader educational community? So, Cynthia, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I want to first say that um, Kathy Lester, when she spoke of her five P's that really resonated with me, the positivity, politeness, preparedness, persistence, and um, being present. And so for me, when I thought about this question, um, for lasting um, relationships that actually help with the literacy and the learning and the leadership. And the reason why I say that is when I go back into 
um, the museum of my memories as a school librarian. I've only been out of the school library for a year. But when I think about it, I think that when I actually had those moments and those experiences where I really had the collaboration, whether it was with teachers or when I did my book in a day and I brought in different individuals, um, when COVID did hit and I wanted to still do my school-wide read, I had developed those relationships um, beforehand so that when I said, hey, would you mind coming and reading a chapter through Zoom, those individuals, whether they were, whether they were district officers, community members, they um, saw the importance of the school library program. And so for me, it was also a way for me to advocate for myself without actually saying anything. Um, so I think for me, it would be the collaborating um, that helps to develop those relationships and partnerships. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. How about you, Jonathan? You know, uh, Cynthia stole the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I was going to say collaboration, too. And I, I mean, I do think that that's the single thing that we can do that's going to move the needle. And I know when I came out of library school, I went into an elementary school where I was a prep teacher, right? And the last that's the last thing anybody wanted to do with me, right? Is because it was their prep. They didn't want to be bothered with what, you know, with whatever was happening in the library. It's not that they weren't interested. It was just that it was their prep, right? So I think there are definitely, you know, I think that, it's one thing to go to library school and learn about the vision, right? And about collaboration. And then it's another thing to go into the real world and try and implement it. So I think that one of the things on my journey that really helped kind of refine my thinking is there was an article posted on the AASL website called Toward a Theory of Collaboration Between Teachers and Librarians. I believe the scholar was out of University of Arizona. I believe her name was Patricia Montiel overall. You can, I, I don't know if that name is ringing a bell for anybody. I, I probably botched it. But the thing that I love is collaboration is a word that we just throw out there. And it's really kind of a very big, vague kind of a word. And I, the thing that I loved was she broke it down into kind of a spectrum between least effective and most effective, you know, starting with coordination, right? Juggling schedules, you know, fixing iPads, you know, things like that, you know, you get the state report books this week, you get them the next week. Coordination is a very low level, um, you know, thing, but still, still an important one. Uh, and then the next thing up the rung was collaboration, which was more of a superficial collaboration, you know, like we'll help each other, we'll answer each other's questions, we might share things with each other. But what we really want is that integrated instruction where they're planning, teaching, and assessing a unit of study that involves the student diving into a line of inquiry. But she goes one step further and says, integrated curriculum is when you can do that with every single teacher in the building. And I have yet to see that. I'm sure there are probably school libraries out there where the, you know, the librarian has been able to do that. I would also say that, I would almost call that a mythical unicorn, right? Like I'll see it when I believe it, right? That you're gonna coordinate with the math teacher and the PE teacher and the SPED teacher and everything. But then for those of us that work with systems, there's a super mythical unicorn, right? How do we make sure that happens at every school in the district? And it's not because, oh, that librarian has a cult of personality or that library is on the other side of the railroad track. So that library has a great PTA that pays for everything. Or that city has, you know, has a, you know, ha is rich and they have a law that funds all their school libraries, you know? So how do you make sure that happens across a system, whether it's a district or a county or a region, a state, a nation? Um, so those are, that's the super mythical unicorn. But I think that I definitely agree that collaboration is the single biggest thing that we could do that would, that would move the needle for us. Great, thanks. So we, um, I'll ask one more, um, and um, we're limited to our time, but I, I'm going to throw a little zinger into the question. So what's the most pressing problem facing school libraries today? And here's my zinger. They didn't get warned about this one. Um, to, to help us empower librarians, how could you help them address that one pressing problem? So Cynthia?
Um, okay, so I'm going to say something. I'm going to say the perception. I think that the perception of, um, you know, when we're in our own circle, we're in our own communities, we know exactly what we do. Um, but I think it's such a hard um thing to explain. I think the elevator speech is a great way to really combat that. But for me, it's the perception because it goes from students to parents to um, community members to administrators. Um, because once they realize what the roles are as a school librarian, I think they, they can grasp a better picture. So I know it seems really simple, but for me, it would be the perception um, that's out there. Jonathan? And once again, I'm gonna agree with Cynthia. That's not what I was thinking when I, when I first saw the question, but to kind of build on what she said before I get to my question, I think one of the things that we really struggle with is that everybody thinks they know what school libraries are and what they do because they've grown up using them, right? And many different kinds. They've used a school library. Their kids have used a school library. Everybody's got a school library. They've used a public library. They've used a, a, a college, an academic library. So they're familiar with the concept of libraries, but they've gone through as a user. And like, our colleagues in education would be able to understand that just because you've been a student in the system doesn't mean you have a good working knowledge of the system because there are other roles, right? Being a student is very different than being a teacher, an administrator, right? It expands your view, it's more complex, there's more moving parts. But for some reason, when it comes to school libraries, people don't understand that duality that just because you're familiar with a library doesn't mean, and I'll give you an example. I. I have a supervisor that um, my supervisor worked in the college library and thought about becoming a librarian. And so that is her show of solidarity. That is her supporting me. That's her understanding me. And in my mind, I sit there and I go, yes, you are now qualified to be a library media technician. But what I really need from you is you were a math teacher, so I need you to go back and think about what's the unit that you and I would collaborate and then come back and tell me, and that would show me that you really understand what's going on here, okay? So I definitely think that there's a perception problem, um, and I think it's rooted in the fact that administrators don't have the capacity to understand. There's a quote I love that says, you can, um, you can manage um, you can manage somebody if you don't understand their job role, but you can't really lead. You can't innovate, you can't lead, you can't disrupt the system. You can just kind of manage it and keep it going, right? Just do your thing and I'll write your evaluation every year, but you're not gonna be in charge of innovation. Now, sorry, what I was initially gonna say in answer to this question was, I think that we have some very real threats to our democracy. And I see two different facets of that. You've got the intellectual freedom challenges that are happening across the country. I think they've probably been the most prominent in Florida and Texas, but they're happening here in California as well as in other states. So I definitely think that's a threat to democracy. And then the other thing that we've been dealing with is a crisis in media literacy and, um, and you know, the health misinformation, the election misinformation. Um, I think that's very insidious and nobody's taking ownership of that, right? Nobody's stepping in to say, I'm going to explicitly teach those skills to students. So I think the threat to democracy with those two facets is what, what I have been initially been leaning to. Thanks to both of you all. I wish we had time to answer the other two, but we're going to move on um, to the next slide for a little more time in our panel. So Jonathan, can you advance that? I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, Thank you. I was reading the chat. You caught me. You caught me trying to <laughs> multitask and read the chat. It's all right. So I, um, I see I've got a lot of um, school library educator peeps out in the audience, and they can speak to this in the chat as well. But 
So how can we as library schools preparing for, for future librarians uh, better prepare them? So I think having um, certification and ALA accredited Committee on Accreditation programs um, is, is you know, the way we hope that all states can go eventually. Um, also focusing on the AASL standards. Um, when we were prepping for this panel, we were talking about the fact that some people have got common core, you know, districts are focusing on different things, but if all of our librarians are out in the field are, are focused on those standards, then we're all speaking from the same hymn sheet. Um, and we all can have a voice together that then um, some of the things that Cynthia and Jonathan were talking about is, is um, marketing and advocating for our programs, it, it helps. Um, I would say multiple opportunities to spend hands-on time in schools. Um, we, we try that very hard and I know a lot of my colleagues in here today do, um, whether it's for assignments or internships, practicums, whatever you wanna call it, but to get people out there in the field as soon as possible so they really know what's going on and can be mentored um, by practicing school librarians. Um, practical and timely resources. Um, and we're gonna be sharing some with you um, and some that Kathy Lester's put together um, as well. Also, you know, your state affiliates, your state associations do a wonderful job. We've got um, the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy. I know um, Valerie, shout out to her, um, came up with a wonderful, we were talking about intellectual freedom issues. They came up with a wonderful resource and we're gonna share the link with you in the next slide. Uh, when all the book, book attempts to ban books started. Um, and then Lucy Santos Green came up with a program um, and it's called Get Ready, Stay Ready. That's for community, for parents um, to get involved. So not just us as librarians, but the piece that Cynthia said of collaborating with others um, to address issues in, in a timely fashion. So, and also um, mentorship opportunities. I mentioned the cohorts. Um, anytime you can to get um, our students attending conferences, let them volunteer to get free registration, go to ASL and do that. And also visit other model programs um, is, is a wonderful way to learn what you want to offer in your um, future excellent programs. So, um, and then if you'll go to the next slide, Jonathan, these are some of the things and you'll be able to link out to those alive. I, I wanted to mention, and I know Anthony's going to touch on this, David um, Lurcher's in the house, and um, he has a wonderful, with the help of his team um, from San Jose, has got tours of school libraries, so talk about model programs. This has videos. It's, it's an excellent resource, and as I said, uh, it'll be touched on some more. Um, the Augusta Baker program has some um, equity, diversity, um, um, and inclusion webinars and things that are available for free for anyone to attend. Um, we need diverse books. Um, the AASL website links to a lot of these things I've just mentioned. So just generically, I put that up there. Um, Kathy Lester, who's already spoken, um, has got a, a great, I think it's about four, four page sheet you can link out to that talks about library professionals and during challenging times. I mentioned the skill um, website. You can even put in there if you've had a book challenge and someone will get back to you. Um, and of course that's true through the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom. And then the Community Action Toolkit for Parents and Caregivers that Lucy Santos Green has done in conjunction with Penguin and some other um, partners. So we wanted to share those with you. We are, um, I think um, we've just got time for some Q&A unless um, Cynthia and Jonathan, do you want to add anything else? You know, I just want to, in the comments, Dr. Bernier mentioned a book called American Public School Librarianship as a history. And I want to second his recommendation. I know you probably can't see it very well, but um, so I would add this as well. It's a really thorough, comprehensive history. So I second that. Um, someone asked about programs for teacher librarian with masters in other countries. I would just answer, I think that would be done by a school by school basis. Um, our graduate programs have, have um, 
rules about that. So whatever program you're interested in, maybe contact um, their admissions person and they would be able to address the fact. I know courses can transfer. It depends in our program on the number of years that, that you took it, but every school's different, but reach out to the ones you're interested in and they'll be able to answer it. Other questions for our group? I think we've just got a few minutes. Um, for those of you who are library educators, what, you know, what would you add that your programs are doing um, that, that you think would help create um, excellent librarians who create excellent programs? I love, um, we've talked a lot about collaboration, but I, you know, the, the ways to collaborate are some of the things we've talked about too, visiting other programs, um, visiting uh, conferences, visiting re regional workshops in states, um, uh, Cindy, is a teaching certificate always necessary? That'll depend on the state too. Um, some states have alternative licensure programs uh, for example, ours is called PACE. Um, we, we would encourage you to go to a library school, but there are alternatives in, in different states. Yeah, key thanks. So that report will tell you kind of what people are asking for. And if you all have peer professionals in your schools who are interested, um, some of our strongest students are the ones who were, uh, you know, staff in the school library and got interested in getting a degree. Uh, it's, it's great because they've seen it, they like it, and they want to do it. Um, so it, it, that's a, a great way to get some future librarians in. I, I see a question in the Q&A about various <laughs> credentialing requirements. I will say, and... Um, you know, I think we have people, I think Dr. Farmer, or, um, Dr. Harlan could probably address those in California. But I will say, generally speaking, people that come from out of state to California are frustrated that there is so much additional coursework that they have to do to get certification. So we, we, are, we make it very challenging to do that. So Terika asked about going to library school online. Um, Several of us on, on this call, I know our program is 100% online. Um, so we have people from all over the nation. Um, so it depends on which program you go to and that's readily available. Um, you can find a list of programs on the ASL website, but it is um, opportunities to be 100% um, or face-to-face -face and, and some maybe hybrid programs as well. exchange programs. That again would depend. Um, we just had some librarians from Taiwan come over in a, and not school librarians, but um, academic librarians. So different programs have opportunities um, for exchanges. And if you're interested in contacting one, maybe I saw so many countries represented, which is great. Um, just contact someone in the program and I'm sure they'd be happy to try to work some things out. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Jonathan. Excellent job. Excellent work. And again, I'm sure everyone probably realizes this, how much work went, behind, went on behind the scenes. So thank you again for sharing your insights. I, I know a lot of great connections will be made today as well. Uh, and certainly our commitment will be to make sure everybody has everybody's contact information uh, as we uh, post the, uh, the slides and recordings. Um, I'm also delighted to present to you uh, work uh, called uh, the Alive Project. Uh, and what we did with that essentially is support uh, the vision of Dr. Uh, Lorcher uh, and also our uh, school library faculty on really bringing together a lot of resources uh, and also doing original research and interviews with people across the country. So uh, it is called the Alive Project. Uh, and uh, a special again, thanks to uh, Dr. Leutcher, Dr. Marion Harlan, and Dr. Blanche Wools for developing this resource 
uh, funded by the SJSUI school. Uh, and also I want to give a shout out to the students and staff who worked tirelessly to get it all ready uh, for showtime for today's symposium. So, uh, Alfredo, if you wouldn't mind, drop the uh, the website address. Uh, and uh, there also will be a virtual reality address, but I would encourage you to not click on that right now uh, because uh, what's wonderful is that virtual reality now is browser-based, uh, but certainly still has been with... Uh, challenges. So, uh, but certainly save that uh, VR link for later exploration. Uh, we view VR as a, uh, adding that third dimension allows us to tell our story uh, in, in more uh, experiential ways. Uh, also wanted to mention that we have a GIS map that's coming out uh, in combination with uh, a GIS consultant and also KEIS results. Uh, we are going to list all state credentials uh, uh, and uh, and the requirements, uh, and also cross reference with demographics in uh, NA, NAEP and other student achievement scores. So again, uh, kudos to Keith and his team for generating so much interesting data, uh, and we're going to do our part to make it uh, visual and sharing it with the rest of the nation. So uh, now I'm really excited to give the rest of the time uh, to some wonderful speakers. Um, uh, so our second panel will be led by National Library Leaders, uh, ALA President Lessa Palayo Lazada, uh, uh, and of course, Kathy Lester, who you heard from earlier, and Kathy Carroll, uh, who will be discussing what specific achievable strategic actions should ta be taken at a federal and state level to address effectively, at a policy level, equity of access for all students to well-funded school libraries staffed by certified school librarians. Alfredo, if you would mind, drop that uh, in the in the chat. Uh, this is, again, the first of, of uh, uh, several series uh, of symposiums, so certainly we're not going to be able to answer that question uh, in, in greatest detail uh, today, but we are going to start. Uh, so a quick introduction to our panelists. Uh, so uh, Lessa Kanani Apua Palayo Lazada, is an adult services assistant manager uh, at the Palos Verdes Library District, Rolling Hills, the states, California, and the 22-23 president of the American Library Association. Uh, she recently completed a term as an LA ALA executive board member and was also elected a counselor at large for three terms. She is an active member of the 1876 Club, the Association for Library Services for Children, CORE, uh, the Public Library Association, the Rainbow Roundtable, the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, and the Sustainability Roundtable. So I, I see uh, we have a future in uh, a, a a similar insomniac uh, th th than myself as well. She's also a member of several ALA professional affiliates, including uh, the Asian Pacific American Library Association, Apollo, the Black Caucus American Library Association, the Chinese American Library Association, the American Indian Library Association. Uh, and the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services, the Latinos to the Spanish-speaking Reforma. Uh, she also has been a member of ALA for over uh, 13 years. Uh, Kathy Carroll. So Kathy Carroll was the 2021 AASL president. Uh, she is a school librarian at Westwood, Westwood High School at, in Blythewood, South Carolina. Uh, she served as the ALA Spectrum Advisory Committee uh, from 2018 to 2020, and is serving as an ALA counselor at large. She also served on the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, Library Media Specialist Standards Committee in 2010, and the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards Teacher Leadership Competency Framework Committee in 2013. Kathy was awarded the ALA Spectrum Scholarship in 2007, and she is a National Board Certified Teacher. And then Kathy Lester, of course, who uh, was our keynote speaker of earlier. Uh, so uh, going back to the big bodacious question, uh, what specific achievable strategic action should be taken at federal and state levels to address effectively at a policy level equity of access for all students to well-funded school libraries staffed by a certified school librarian? Uh, and I think uh, Alessa has asked... Uh, to go uh, after uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy and Kathy. Uh, so let me let me start with uh, uh, either Kathy Lester or Kathy Carroll uh, on your thoughts. And certainly, this is just a discussion. So um, I can go first if you want. Um, I know that initially you asked um, what can LIS educators do to help, and I kind of brainstormed some ideas where 
um, building relationships with state education departments and helping work with them to strengthen the guidelines and requirements for school librarians within your state because every state is so different right now. Um, also, I feel like there is a perception of administrators that don't understand the leadership role and the partnership and what school librarians can do for them. Um, and I mentioned in the chat that I do feel like, especially in states that where the numbers have declined so much that there are administrators now in positions that have never experienced an effective school library. So they don't have that experience. So if um, you could build relationships somehow with education departments within your universities to help reach out and try to present to those administrator groups what school librarians can do to help partner to achieve educational goals and build a positive school climate. Um, I know that AASL has a playlist of videos that um, could be used in those um, uh, with our um, school library leadership collaborative. We've developed a set of videos that talk where administrators are talking about what school librarians can um, do to help them reach their educational goals in their districts. Um, I have, um, so um, just joining in the advocacy um, for support for school libraries um, at the government level as well. Um, and then I also feel like um, a part of the educational preparation for school librarians needs to train them how to be leaders and advocates as well, even if it's just for their own program. Um, and hopefully they'll become more involved in their states and things like that well. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about the shortage of school librarians. Um, so I do feel like we need support um, committing to help fulfilling this shortage. And I liked, um, Karen talked about that partnership with districts um, where they partner with certain districts, school districts um, to have teachers come to their programs um, to add that school library certification. Um, that might be one way, um, maybe if that model could be expanded to other programs as well. I know it's something that um, Wayne State University in Michigan has been um, trying to do as well. Um, but maybe that would um, help. Um, I've got other ideas too, but I wanna um, let Kathy and Lessa talk a little bit too. Okay, well, thank you, Kathy, for that. And thank you for that question. I find it ironic that school librarians are one of the few professions where when we advocate for ourselves, it's perceived as being self-serving as if we're all trying to protect our jobs when it's a common fact that there is a shortage. We're not trying to just be self-serving. We're not, it's not self-preservation. It is about our learners. It's about our learning communities. And I think that's something we have to continually remind people of. I'm speaking on behalf of those who do not have a voice. I'm speaking on behalf of my profession and incoming professionals. So I think we need to take that conversation off the table immediately and say, I'm doing this for the betterment of. And I also think this is a very complicated, nuanced topic, but I think we need to start small. We need to start with our homegrown grassroots advocates. And that for school librarians would be our parents. It would be our administrators. And as Kathy referenced, ASL has a cohort, our second cohort of school leader, um, the school leader collaborative. And those are administrators, principals, superintendents who've been nominated by their school librarians who already have an interest in and support school librarians, but just need to have a deeper understanding and also to collaborate on a more meaningful and intentional level with member leaders in order to be better advocates because they already have the heart for advocacy. They already support, but they need to understand, they need to possess a toolkit to do so more effectively. This is our second cohort. We have 
um, leaders from across the country who are working with us and who are going forth. They're spreading the word with their colleagues. They're speaking on our behalf locally and nationally. And so I think we have to grow our own. We, for whatever reason, cannot be the only voice. And so we have to prepare other people. And as I said, we're going to start small and we start at our base level. And then we're going to take advantage of the very rich ecosystem that we have. And we're going to reach out and we're going to talk to our State Department of Education members. And I have an embarrassment of riches of having the University of South Carolina's LIS program right in my backyard. I'm in South Carolina. And so I have all of those resources. Some may not have that advantage, but I'm taking advantage of what I have. And Dr. Gavigan and the others are such rich resources and such strong advocates. But also I think we, again, we cannot wait until it's an election. We cannot wait until it's a dire situation, which it is now. We have to be very persistent and consistent with our dialogue with lawmakers. Because it's because our goal is to have language included on a federal level, but we have to make sure that we have representation on a state level. And the way we conduct those goals is by relationships. And I think everything just comes down to relationships. We have to invite them in. We have to let them see what we do. For some reason, everyone understands what a teacher does, but everyone seems to be perplexed about what a school librarian does. And so therefore we have to show the gains that are going to be made when you have a qualified certified librarian in the building that research continually indicates the growth and so therefore we really have to focus on the data. People love data. And fortunately we have the data to prove that this is not a luxury, but a requirement. This is a necessity. And again, as Kathy stated earlier in her previous um, wonderful keynote, she showed how oftentimes those who suffer, and I will use the word suffer greatly, and to the greatest extent are those who are our most vulnerable. Those without the access, without resources, and therefore, we definitely have to advocate for them. And then we saw that graph of how I am in a section of the country that understands the benefits of having a school librarian, but there are other regions. And during my term, unfortunately, I was privy to so many stories and information about how it was not deemed appropriate. And just very quickly, a very short anecdote, of one principal wanted to close a school. And then he offhandedly said, well, the, the students can just go to the public library. And the librarian had to remind him, we don't have a public library. This is it. And I'm working for free after hours so other people can come into the library. And it was just said in such an offhanded manner. And I'm sure the intention was not ill, but it was given in a way as if, of course, this is accessible. Of course, this is a given. And I think we have to show people that we don't safeguard what we have now, it's not a given. Then it can quickly, it can quickly become a memory in many parts of our country. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Lessa? Thank you, Anthony. And thank you for, for Kathy and Kathy going first. I always defer to all matters of school librarians to my AASL presidents, um, because while I am representing libraries nationally, they are the experts on school libraries. So I always learn so much from listening to them both. And so from kind of my big picture you know, perspective, for me, it's organizing, 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 right? Our school librarians cannot do it alone. And so us it, who are in other areas of libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries have to be able to support. But even larger than just within the LIS field, we have to look to what Kathy referred to earlier as the full library ecosystem, right? And so what the library ecosystem is, is that interconnected network of all types of libraries, library workers, volunteers, associations, community members, families, K through 20 learners. I'm just gonna go through the list to make sure we're hitting everyone. College and university communities, local state and federal legislatures and government offices. We're also talking businesses, nonprofits, everyone within our community is part of our library ecosystem. And so we have to be able to tap into those resources in our advocacy fight because our wonderful school library advocates 
know exactly the wonderful things they do, but until everybody else, as folks have said all day, can recognize, you know, what those benefits are and that they are not costs, they are benefits to our learners, they are benefits to our society, then that is when we will be able to do that true advocacy. And so some of the tools that we have to, able, to be able to support that advocacy within ALA, you know, is through our public policy and advocacy office, through AASL, those tools and resources are not just for very specific, you know, legislative items, they can be expanded into that grassroots organizing, going to the school library board, writing letters to your school board, writing letters to your board of education to be able to support what is happening, whether or not you have a child in the district. Right. I don't have children in the district, but what happens at the elementary, you know, the K through 12 level absolutely affects my daily life as a community member. And so if we can tap into those community members who can help support, I think that those are some of the really tangible things that we'll be able to do. Um, Kathy Lester also shared with me before, and I'll drop these links into the chat, the ALA State Legislative Kit that has some of these tools on how to talk to folks, how to write letters and support, um, as well as the Adverse Legislation Kit. Um, because we have so much adverse legislation coming up around book bans, around school libraries, around funding, you know, these are really serious things that are just impacting what this persistent issue of the need for school librarians has been. And so I'll share those links in the chat, but just so that we have those as resources also to make sure that we're tapping into and sharing those with everyone on the broader level, because it is only through that unified messaging that I think we can really achieve what we need to in the school library level. Wonderfully said, Lessa. There, I was ready to jump out of my chair. <laughs> um, so let me uh, let me ask you a few uh, questions. So again, I apologize in advance for not getting these to you uh, with more advanced warning. But I also wanted to just again uh, leverage all of the expertise and experience here to get on the record some things that we might be able to share in our advocacy work uh, in the future. So let me ask you. Um, I guess, a loaded question. Uh, so some school libraries are run by parents. Some are run by teachers without a school library credential. In your opinion, what's the specific differences on why a credential is so important? And uh, maybe I'll start with Kathy. Carol, uh, your, your thoughts on just some of the specifics. Uh, you know, if we were, if we were using uh, your edited uh, video for a superintendent or a principal, uh, what would you say? Well, unfortunately, this is a reality. It's not just some, I don't know, some fictitious scenario. And we do have so many well-intentioned, but not well-prepared people out there trying to, to, to work and to create a library program. And it is necessary to have the credentials. I think there are very few professions where we would think, okay, a person with a big heart and an interest can go in and do a good job that will be equal to the person who's trained and certified. I, I just, I'm not quite sure where that came from, but I think it's almost a compliment to us that we make it seem so effortless in what we do and the contributions that we make that people think that almost anyone can do it. But I think we're educated. Many of us have advanced degrees in this area for a reason, because it is a craft. It is a profession that takes critical thinking, that there's a skill set, there's information that's needed to be acquired before you can do it successfully. And someone can manage a space, but to make it an innovative, creative, aspirational space, it takes someone with the credentials. And so I applaud anyone who is filling a space that otherwise would be empty, but that should not be satisfactory. That should be worst case scenario. And I think we're doing a disservice to all of our learning communities and our, and our students, our kids, when we don't have the best qualified people in those spaces. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, uh, Kathy or Lessa? Um, 
I shared in the chat uh, a visual guideline document. It was actually developed by Dorcas Hand and a group of um, school librarians in Houston, Texas. And when I saw it, I reached out to her and got permission to Michiganize it because they used a little bit terminology about their school districts and such than we did. But I feel like it's really an excellent resource. It really shows what a school librarian is prepared to do and how they serve their students compared to what a, you know, paraprofessional or parent volunteer or even classroom teachers can do. They don't have the same preparation that we do. Um, in terms of being able to curate resources, teach information literacy skills, all of the things that are really so important to what we do. Um, I feel like um, one time I remember I was at a Michigan School Improvement Conference um, presenting about school librarians and the important work that we do. And there were some administrators in the audience and their question was, well, how do I train my paraprofessional to do that work? And I said, well, they need to go to library school and get the degree. I mean, they want, um, you know, there's so much, there had been so much pressure on education um, budgets that they were trying to basically get the same work out of someone who they could pay a lot less, I think. Um, and um, I think that's even coming to the forefront now. And um, with the book banning and book challenges um, that in these areas where they don't have a certified school librarian curating those resources and understanding um, selection policies, reconsideration policies, those districts now are like in, not in very good shape in terms of being able to, um, so you know, I think in Florida, the law is now requiring that they have a certified school librarian selecting the resources. So in spite of all the bad stuff going on there, um, you know, there might be a chance to use this um, really, really negative time to try to also spotlight and highlight the positives of what we do and how what we do is so important and the training that we receive is really important um, to the work that we do and how we support our students. Thank you, Kathy. Lessa? So I, I come from um, a school district that my library is in that's a fairly affluent community. However, we only have certified school librarians at the high school level. And so what happened a couple of weeks ago was because of the, the book challenges and all of the issues that we've seen, our young readers librarians reached out to the school district to kind of give like a two hour rundown to the volunteers, to the library aides, to be able to help them understand what their actual role are. And I will tell you that um, the manager who put together the training said that, of course, two hours was just touching the surface. A lot of these folks were not prepared for the book challenges that will likely be coming their way from parents. You know, during um, during the height of the pandemic, we had a number of parents come to us as, as the public library to ask for help in how to um, challenge some of the books in their school libraries because they were outdated, because there weren't policies attached to them. And so I think that, you know, what I see firsthand is one, again, a disservice to the students because they don't have individuals who are trained in collection development to be able to curate the resources that they need. They don't have folks who have the time also to be able to dedicate that one-on-one -on -one time with them. It's come in, check out a book, leave, but the books are also from the early 2000s, you know, if we're, if we're pretty lucky. And so providing them with these resources then falls to other arenas who are not actually trained also to be providing the training that comes with an MLIS. And so I just really wanna undergird that I think the main difference is when 
we have certified school librarians who have that training, we can point to that when book challenges arise. We can point to that when people say, well, why do we need it? We have folks who have that big heart and who really want it, but we have to say that is not enough because we have to demonstrate our expertise that we have in providing the tools to your children to be competent, to be literate, um, to be able to have all of the, that access to information that they need to be full members of society, which of course I think is also probably part of the issue, right? Because we are trying to build a critical thinking society of individuals who can figure things out for themselves. And that is part of the struggle here, I think, and the disempowerment of school libraries is to take away that power from the individuals to be able to make those decisions for themselves and think for themselves. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lessa. I'll vote for you again, too. Um, so two quick questions. Uh, so the first one is, this, it, goes, it goes back to my original point about social, the social economic divide. So even in libraries that have certified teacher librarians, oftentimes the budget is driven through fundraising. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, kind of the different, uh, doing that through parents in particular, and maybe the social economic divide that's created when that is the primary mechanism for a budget? Now I'll throw it to the Kathy's first. <laughs> well, I can talk to that because I have experienced it. I'm in a school district where we do have a certified school librarian in every school. And that isn't normal in Michigan, but it is true in my district. But my specific school has the highest number of free and reduced lunch students. So it has the highest level of poverty um, out of the five middle schools. Um, and so when we, um, the district gave us a tiny little budget, I have like $200 a year. And so the, we're expected to raise money for that um, through book fairs, through other fundraising activities. But yet I, I land up raising the least amount if I rely on some of those parent funded activities because of the make socioeconomic makeup. So I have done other things. You know, I've written other grants. I've, you know, but not all, you know, it, it's tiring <laughs> to do that. And it's hard to uh, maintain that. So um, we've been advocating as a group in our district to try to get more money from our district. And fortunately, we have been able to do that. But I do feel also like um, this might be one of those equity issues that there are states that have at least some level of state funding that goes to their um, school libraries for school library resources. And I feel like that would be really important to help with that, you know, economic division um, to provide that for all schools. Else. Thank you, Kathy. And I, I'm going to ask Kathy, of course, uh, uh, to speak to this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, before you do, Imagine a field where you do not have a budget to do what you're expected to do. Uh, it, it's, it's just mind boggling. But anyway, Kathy, go ahead. Well, I'd like to echo what Kathy said. Um, I've had years where I had officially had a zero budget year, but was expected to move the program forward. And I too spent time writing grants, looking for other sources of revenue. And sometimes when I reflect on that, I think it's just really evident of a much larger societal problem of where we put our money and where we think it is optional and to whom it has the most adverse effects and what is the long lasting ramifications. And that's for another day. But I just don't think it's a coincidence that oftentimes the library, the school library has the zero budget or a minuscule budget. And even if the school is having financial problems, oftentimes there are other activities or other areas that are funded. And so I've spent an exorbitant amount of time trying to look for, um, for the funding. And I think, again, it affects certain groups more so than others. And they are the groups that need the support. They need the funding but oftentimes this is site-based or district-based. 
And I think it is to their detriment. And I feel like as if I'm a, as if I'm repeating myself, but I see that all of these issues oftentimes direct our most vulnerable the most, because if they're coming from an affluent neighborhood or, or, or area, there's probably plenty of funding, or if there's not, it can be supplemented from outside sources fairly easily. And this is not the case in many areas. So I am, as Kathy said, I am fortunate to be in an area where we have um, certified school librarians in most of our schools and also throughout our state, but the funding again is typically site-based. It is a problem and it is an ongoing concern, but we're a resourceful group and we do what we can. I would love to make that more, to include that more in conversations, to make it equitable across the board. Thank you, Kathy. Lessa? Both the Kathy said it perfectly. I mean, it is an equity issue that sees libraries as a cost rather than a benefit and relies on making literacy a an ad rather than what the core of what it all should be. So I cannot add anything more to their personal stories there. Thank you, Alessa. So the final question really goes back to LIS education. So uh, Jackie and others, of course, had mentioned the fact that they're being asked to do things that uh, really remove their ability to do uh, what they really are supposed to be doing. Uh, and to be candid, uh, oftentimes there seems to be a disconnect even at the university level in terms of, say, pr uh, principal preparation uh, and understanding the role of school libraries. So uh, a general question, how, how do we address this disconnect that seems to be occurring both at the school level? So a scenario, I am a school librarian whose principal doesn't seem to understand uh, what I do or what I'm supposed to do. And then at the university level, uh, any thoughts on how we address that with our own colleagues? Because to be honest, I am part of the problem if I'm not educating the College of Education uh, and feel uh, uh, strongly that that they are providing uh, or, uh, we're, or we're supporting uh, education so that they understand uh, what a school library can do for them. So, but uh, let me stop. Uh, let me start with the Cathy's. How do we improve that disconnect and that education? Well, I've been fortunate to work with the AASL um, School Leader Collaborative for the last two years, and I'm currently working with the second cohort. And it's been hugely beneficial in that it showed me the thinking of our school leaders and where perhaps this disconnect would, would happen, where it would occur. And I think a lot of times it's just, it derives from sometimes a previously bad experience and they carry that over into current situations or it's just really a lack of understanding. And I think regardless, it comes to communication and it also, it cannot be in isolation. I think it's going to be important and that's what I try to do is just to incorporate school leadership throughout the fabric of the programming, of our activities, of what we do. And so therefore it's not some foreign concept and it's not just for special occasions, but it's just an open invitation to see what we do, to see what we create, to see how we contribute, not just with our students, but with our whole faculty and staff. And so I think once we, it's determined and seen that we're a part of the fabric of the success of our programming in our school, then I think that makes the conversations easier and the disconnects and the misunderstandings start to slowly dissipate. And as far as university is concerned, again, I don't think I'm that person to ask because I'm in South Carolina with the University of South Carolina and I could not ask for a stronger program producing better colleagues and they have a true understanding. And we have conversations and I've been on the advisory board for the college for, um, for a few years and they listen and we talk and they, there's no presumption. They ask questions. They're receptive to feedback. So I know that's not the case for everyone. And I know there are perhaps some programs that need to have a tweak or what have you, but I've been very fortunate. And again, I think the best we all can do is just to try to communicate with others. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I can 
say in Michigan, we created what we call an administrator toolkit. And the toolkit basically, um, we developed it in with the Michigan Department of Ed. So it says it's a Michigan Department of Ed toolkit, but of course we have a new superintendent now, so I might have to be updating it. But um, it basically talks about the what, why, how of school libraries that um, administrators can use and it links to some videos and things like that. And, um, and I know that Wayne State is also um, aware of that toolkit. And um, I believe that um, it's been, and we've shared it with, you know, the different organizations, the administrator, different administrator groups and things like that. So maybe something like that, if there is a disconnect to um, some type of tool connect. And since education still seems to be like a local control thing, um, you know, I could share what we did in Michigan, but it would have to be like, you know, like I Michiganize things other and, you know, states would probably have to do the similar thing in their districts. So I think something like that um, might be helpful to help with that disconnect. Um, I do think like the model school library program, and again, in Michigan, the Library of Michigan has a model school library program, but it, I think is smaller. Maybe we have one model school library every year. Um, and I was the model school library in the 2018, 2019 school year. And we um, invite different, you know, anyone to come visit that library. And that year that I was the model school library, I went around and presented at, a at administrator conferences at, you know, the school improvement conference at a bunch of different conferences um, a little bit to, again, dispel that myth. But as you saw my graph, is it enough? It's <laughs> it's turned the tide, but there's still a lot of, of work that needs to be done. So, thank you, Kathy. Definitely would be great if you could share that. Uh, I think it would be very useful, and we can, like you said, uh, individual customize it by state. So, but thank you, Alessa. And the only thing that I will add is, uh, in the words of the great Diane Chen, school librarian of Tennessee, is that there should be a school librarian at every single table. So if you are an LIS educator, you're an administrator, and you look around and you don't see a school librarian at that table, you need to go find yourself one. And if you are a school librarian and you see a table that you are not at, you need to go pull up your own chair and give yourself a seat at that table. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned that, Lessa. I, I have heard that uh, we certainly are not as present as we should be at some of the non-library conferences, right? It's so like ISTE, for example. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that that's a, a great a great point. So, unfortunately, we are uh, nearing the end of our time. Um, uh, definitely, let's make sure we document any questions that aren't answered. Um, uh, Sanda, do you want to say a few words? And I've just got a few uh, parting words at the end there, so. I was so busy reading comments. This was immensely valuable. I uh, shared a couple of uh, my needs at the beginning, what I would like to learn uh, from. And I see that uh, there is the avalanche on information that I still need to process. Uh, the only thing I can say thank you to all, uh, everybody on the panels, all the participants, everybody who shared uh, their questions and comments, and I'm definitely looking forward to the next two uh, meetings. Great. Thanks Thank to you, Anthony, too, for really spearheading this event. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for all your support. Uh, special thanks, of course, everybody for your time and attention, obviously all the panelists. Uh, let's give them a, a, a round of applause or emotional uh, emoticon or... <laughs> Um, in discussions with AASL and ALA, uh, this is the first of a three-part or maybe more series on school libraries. The next two will be sponsored directly by AASL in collaboration with the iSchools and, of course, many others. Um, we just want to help. Uh, we want to effusively thank everyone again for their time and commitment. I want to thank Alfredo Alcantar, our, our marvelous uh, 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 Zoom administrator, um, and again, this is our first symposium, and we look forward to working together with all of you to make school libraries stronger. A full recording and transcript will be made available soon. And I thank you all very much uh, for joining us today and have a wonderful day. <laughs>